Hello, everybody. Good to be with you. I'm Michael Millerman, millermanschool.com. And today I have just one article to go over with you. This is Curtis Yarvin writing at graymirror.substack.com, gray with an A. This came out today, Principles of the Deep Right. I thought it could be nice for us to look at it together. If you don't know why someone sent you this link, he writes, here's an essay about me and Tablet, which we read on this channel, and another about me and my fiance in Vanity Fair, which we read on this channel. I have not read these, these articles, he writes. I think writers should avoid reading about themselves. Friends assure me they're not perfect, but pretty good, I mean considering. And they are. Both the Tablet article and the Vanity Fair article are pretty good, all things considered. But if to you, he says, they make me or my ideas seem boring or weird or dangerous or something, this stuff is probably not for you. That's fine, it's not for most people, and there are many senses in which it is dangerous. Most people are what they are, imperfect, beautiful, mere human beings who should stick to the airport bookstore. If someone sent you this link, someone thinks you're looking for something. It may look like you have found a part or two of it yourself. Would you like to know more? The deep right. So here we go. We're getting into Curtis Yarvin on the deep right from graymirror.substack.com. Gray with an A. The deep right. The first question about anything is what to call it. The essays above, I'm told, use new right. This label has some merits, principally that it's a neutral label in connotation, neither aggrandizing like modern monetary theory or pejorative like terrorist. From a marketing perspective, there's a case for both aggrandizing and ironically pejorative labels, but not, I think, in this case. I'm certainly not prominent enough to own New Right, which is a big tent, with more intellectual variety in one corner of the ground sheet than the whole Ivy League, to say nothing of its hilarious historical ambiguity. Uh, so just out of curiosity, let's see, what do we get if we pop over here? We get a Wikipedia article on the New Right. Okay, so you might like to look at that. Let's go back to Yarvin. But I want to stake a claim on my favorite little micro label, Deep Right. By the power of SEO, I decree as follows. Anyone who calls themselves this but doesn't like agree with me is a phony. Ban him or something. I like Deep Right because it's not aggrandizing but mildly positive with a hint of risk as in Deep End. It mirrors Deep State. It has a little bit of flavor but not so much as to be cringe. And the brand is mine, so I get to make its rules. As a philosophy of politics, the deep right has five principles. It is timeless, neutral, absolute, vital, and realist. So let's go over these properties with Curtis Yarvin, timeless, neutral, absolute, vital, and realist. And you can already comment if you'd like, what do you think about this name, the deep right, as opposed to the new right or some other alternative. Timelessness. Many speak of the current thing, and the current year. But no current year is an island. We all live within the current period, at every time scale, from week to millennium. The deep right is timeless. It knows that the current period is not in any way inherently better or special than all periods. All ages stand equal before God. What historians call Whig history or presentism is a parochial and chauvinistic belief in the superiority of the current period. We could call it paleophobia. Whig history is an erroneous attribution of the progress of physical science into the political. Also, it displays a remarkable ignorance of the historical pattern of regime evolution, which outside of the current period is never monotonic and always cyclic. By the way, you guys know Alexander Dugan in the fourth political theory has a chapter called Critique of Monotonic Processes. Maybe the current period is different, or maybe it's just part of yet another cycle. If disproving worked, the 20th century would have disproved Whig history. Actually, we have no reason to think that Barack Obama or the sages of his age understands political philosophy any better or worse than Henry Tudor or the sages of his age. We do not even know that Obama's fiscal and monetary policies are superior. The deep right, remember Yarvin giving us this new term, knows that new ideas are not necessarily superior to old ones, nor are old ideas necessarily superior to new ones. Timelessness is a special case of neutrality. The linguistic analogy of presentism to racism is crude but conscious. All ages stand equal before God, but only before God judges them. History too must judge, but judge without prejudice. Okay, principle number one, 
timelessness. I wonder what you think about that. It's consistent with Leo Strauss, for example, his argument against historicism, his argument against progressivism. It's compatible with Dugan. And it's compatible with some of the other thinkers that we treat on this channel and in my school, Plato and Aristotle, each in their own way. Anti-progressivism, timelessness. Second, neutrality. Which side are you on? Leave it for children, wrote Robin Jeffers, or the emotional rabble of the streets to back their horse or support a brawler. The deep right is neutral. It has no dog in any fight, not even the current conflict in the current period. It knows that there's no advantage in taking any side in a struggle. I wonder what you guys think about that, because typically when you consider the right, you do think about it as taking side in a struggle. You do think about it as having a dog in the fight. But Yarvin is suggesting that no, it doesn't and it shouldn't. Not only does the deep right have no position in the red state, blue state, American culture war, its members are, like me, more likely to have a blue state background. If we define the indigenous core right as the core right, the deep right has a Coriolanus vibe. We're mostly defecting from our own tribe to defend our hereditary enemies. But we're not submitting to these Volskians. The purpose of the deep right is not to follow the core right, but to lead it. The pattern of history will not be altered. And in this pattern, the productive classes are always governed by unproductive aristocrats. Every true revolution is the replacement of an old aristocracy by a new one. Since the core right is the party of the productive classes, it's desperately in need of leadership. In principle, like the early 20th century progressives, remember that before Woodrow Wilson, the Democrats were America's conservative party, the deep right could take power through either party. After all, the closest, most recent thing to an American regime change was the New Deal. DC today is essentially the bureaucratic successor of FDR's personal dictatorship. Of course, for a prospective new regime, it's not necessary to have the support of any one side or party. It's only necessary to win. But a new regime will have to govern the whole country, so drawing support from all cultures is a test of its future strength. It's not necessary for drawing support from all cultures to imply some compromise between all cultures, some beige blend of pureed Americana. There's no American culture and there never should be, Yarvin writes here. Rather, peace in the cold civil war will be assured when each culture learns to and is forced to respect all others and leave them alone. Red or blue no more feel the right to rule another than the Amish to rule Philadelphia. And needless to say, the deep right has no interest in overseas conflicts. Its foreign policy is to shut down the empire. Stories of foreign wars are of human interest only. While these wars are often sad and sometimes even monstrous, John Quincy Adams had something to say about the subject. The deep right thinks Adams was right. And being timeless, we do not dismiss him for being 200 years old. In war, neutrality is the highest form of pacifism. In an example from the current year, the deep right is not rooting for Putin, nor does it have Ukraine on the brain. When we see an anti-war rally whose platform is shipping more guns, bombs, and tanks to one side of a war, or we hear a phrase like no justice, no peace, we laugh sadly. Only the dead have seen the end of war. Neutrality is the only non-aggressive way to make peace. Unfortunately, when most people talk about peace, what they actually mean is victory. We can't all agree on victory. We can all agree on neutrality. For instance, again, this is Yarvin talking about the principles of the deep right at graymirror.substack.com, gray with an A. His first principle was the timelessness of the deep right. And here he's talking about its neutrality. For instance, one ingredient of the neutral style of peace is the resolution of conflicts uti posidetis. The war ends and everybody keeps exactly the territory they have now. The new border is the current front. Scholars of the law of nations used to consider a war as a sort of lawsuit engaged in to redress some grievance by the ultima ratio regum, the last argument of kings. In this frame, the aggressor in a 20th century model becomes a sort of plaintiff. The party that considers the uti posidetis unjust and wants more, the victim in the theology of democratic international relations is a sort of defendant who accepts the status quo. What this model does not tell us, this is a key point, I guess, that Yarvin's driving us here, does not tell us is who is right or wrong. It lets us 
explain wars as more than the sick crimes of the evil demons, villains, and madmen who are our enemies. Again, we pass from the frame of a child to the frame of an adult. So you could say here under neutrality, he's saying, number one, don't have a dog in the fight. Don't pick sides. You're neither for nor against. You're sort of taking a higher position like Aristotle says the political philosopher does when faced with disputes. He has to see the partial justice of each side, but rise above their partiality to a more comprehensive perspective. So that's in part how I would rephrase what Yarvin is mentioning here. Okay, neutrality is his second principle. Now we go to the third principle of the deep right, according to Curvis Yarvin's latest graymirror.substack.com post. Vitalism. What is the purpose of life? Is it pleasure? Whatever said purpose may be, the purpose of government is surely to promote that individual purpose across the population. Americans today certainly seem to believe that the purpose of life is the pursuit of pleasure. The sincerity of this belief, however, does not make them right. Certainly most societies in history, including most of their ancestors, would disagree. The deep right is vitalist. It believes that the purpose of life is vitality, and the purpose of good government is the promotion of general and immeasurable human vitality. I'll pause for a minute, and we'll go on with Yarvin in a, in a moment, but you know, I've recently been teaching Aristotle's politics at millermanschool.com, and Aristotle has something to say about the purpose of a human life and the relationship to a regime and its guiding principles. And you know this idea that what life is all about is vitality and that government should be about the promotion of vitality. That's a answer that doesn't totally map onto uh, some of the most thoughtful accounts given in the history of political philosophy. So let's see what else Yarvin has to say about it. Unlike pleasure, which can be measured statistically with the model that consumer dollars spent uh, as a rough proxy for pleasure or so-called utility, human vitality is immeasurable in principle. Some aspects of vitality can be measured. Physique is an important part of vitality and there are many excellent metrics of physique, but the problem of vitality as a whole will never submit to any kind of political statistics. Thomas Carlyle called this the condition of England question. The problem that the health of a nation, the salus populi, whose preservation and improvement is the purpose of government, cannot be measured. The craze for government by steam for some scientific or mechanical process of decision-making above mere human frailty was just beginning. Carlyle saw right through it, and now quoting Carlyle. A witty statesman once said, you might prove anything by figures. We have looked into various statistical works, statistics society reports, poor law reports, reports and pamphlets, not a few with a sedulous eye to this question of the working classes and their general condition in England. We grieve to say, with as good as no result, whatever. Tables are abstractions, and the object the most concrete one, so difficult to read the essence of. There are innumerable circumstances, and one circumstance left out may be the vital one on which all turned. Statistics is a science which ought to be honorable, the basis of many most important sciences, but it is not to be carried on by steam, this science, any more than others are. A wise head is requisite for carrying it on. Okay, I interject here. This wise head is what Aristotle called prudence. Okay, you don't have the mathematization or quantification of political affairs. You need the quote-unquote wise head. A wise head is requisite for carrying it on. Conclusive facts are inseparable from inconclusive, except by a head that already understands and knows. Unquote, that was Carlyle. One thing the deep right knows is that the condition of a nation is the condition of the humans in it. And that condition, the common good, if you like, can never be measured in dry numbers, only assessed by human wisdom. I'm in full agreement with that. A vital human being is operating at their full human potential. Even this potential varies between humans and between groups of humans. When we look at America today, do we feel that most people we see are living up to their full human potential? You would have to be like, hi, to think that. The condition of America is terrible. Yet, if you're not convinced of this, it would be folly for me to try to prove it. Okay, so he's appealing to people who already recognize that the condition of America is terrible, that people are not living up to their full human potential. I think all of that is fair enough to acknowledge. But uh, I do have a question here about whether vitality is the right characteristic for... Um, you know, for saying that this is what's best for the human being and it's what's best for the political community. It's missing, it's important, it's crucial, and yet I guess something would depend on the interpretation of vitality. So again, we're reading 
Curtis Yarvin, graymirror.substack.com, gray with an A. His latest post today on the deep right, the principles of the deep right. We now have three of them on the table. Just a little reminder for those of you who forgot or who just joined. Timelessness, neutrality, and as we just heard, vitalism. And now we move to the fourth principle, realism. By the way, thanks for being here. Good to quote unquote see you. Appreciate uh, your time and attention. The deep right is the faction of truth. It knows that the great intellectual institutions of our era do not deserve our unconditional trust. And it knows that their conclusions cannot be accepted universally at face value. Yes, I think we'd all agree with that and admit it. To act in any serious way requires an accurate assessment of objective reality. To act in unreality can produce arbitrarily bad results, irrespective of intention. Therefore, the deep right must be realist in every possible way. Yes, must be related to reality, must have an accurate assessment of objective reality. In that sense, I think we can all agree with Yarvin here that the deep right must be realist. But the old regime is not reliable, so all its ideas and ideals must be revised. Often they are good and will prove good, but in general, realism implies revision. I'm not sure that's true in general, but okay, you can see under the circumstances, realism implies revision because the real state of affairs lacks vitality, not to mention the other things that he's already pointed out. While these old institutions, older than anyone living, are still populated by very talented human beings, their marketplace of ideas has become corrupted by power. One clear symptom of this corruption is their increasing ideological synchronization. Only one product is on sale in the marketplace of ideas, or at least only one flavor. Unfortunately, everything contaminated with this flavor must be recalled and revised. That follows from the principle of realism implying uh, revision. We trust these polycentric institutions because they are redundant. Since there are many of them, all the universities and publishers could not all go wrong at once. We see them all agreeing with each other. What's up with that? We trust the marketplace of ideas because structurally it's a multipolar bazaar of every possible idea. <clears throat> that I think he means like in the best case scenario, that's what it could be. In our bazaar, we trust that good ideas will, all, will outcompete bad ideas. But when we open our eyes, we do not see a bazaar at all, but a unipolar cathedral. So let me just point out, you all know the notion of the cathedral. We've covered it in the last couple of episodes reading the other articles. Here you have it linked to unipolarity and set against the vision of the bazaar as a multipolar alternative to the unipolar cathedral. Well, you know, multipolar is a little bit of a technical buzzword term in Dugan's political theory. So I just take the occasion to connect Yarvin and Dugan. Don't know what you think about that, but do it anyways. The American university does not have a pope. It might as well have a pope. It is as ideologically uniform as the College of Cardinals at last. Yet its local branches at every tier of prestige are independently owned and operated. What's up with that? Refusing absolute trust to the professors does not mean refusing all trust. It means that all trust is conditional. It means treating Western post-war scholarship as we treat Eastern post-war scholarship as unevenly trustworthy. I was looking, I thought I'd show you a book. I just read R. R. Reno's The Return of the Strong Gods. It tells you something about the configuration of Western post-war scholarship, or rather of the Western post-war ideological consensus. That gives you something uh, to think about. Anyway, Soviet chemistry was excellent. Soviet psychology was pretty much worthless. Soviet history was hit or miss. But no one can prove anything by a mere reference to the Soviet literature. Such a reference must be accompanied by an argument which explains why that area of Soviet academia was sound. I like this about Curtis Yarvin. Don't collapse things too easily into one soup. You know you have to keep them separate, like he's doing here with the various disciplines in Soviet literature. Same thing in Western academia. If an area of Western academia is unsound, the new regime must find and replace it. Realism is revision. In principle, any new regime must think from scratch. And, you know, we can even remove the scratch and just pray that a new regime will think in the first place, that would be a good start, even if it's not thinking from scratch. In principle, thinking from scratch does not involve skepticism of math or physics or even chemistry, because it's quite easy to validate the hard sciences from scratch. For every field softer than chemistry, though, the skeptic must tread carefully. In principle, the deep right claims the right to investigate, judge, and revise any area of artifice or endeavor. Thinking from scratch is merely intellectual sovereignty. Of course, no Truly new regime can arise without reclaiming, oh, sorry, I read that as reclaiming, without claiming 
its intellectual sovereignty. By the way, here, a much more complicated question than might uh, meet the eye. What is intellectual sovereignty for a regime? Thinking about the history of political philosophy is helpful there. Thinking about foundations of political theory, science, and philosophy in Aristotle and Plato is helpful. But you should consider that question. What is intellectual sovereignty for a new regime or for any regime? With this sovereignty must come seriousness. In any way in which the new regime takes issue with the conclusions of the old regime, the superior depth and incisiveness of its thought must be palpable. Even its art must be better and more striking. Every true revolution in power is accompanied by a corresponding revolution in the arts. Let me pause for a minute. While this vision should at least excite some of you, a reinvigoration of the arts, everything getting better and more striking, intellectual sovereignty, vitality, as you saw in principle three. Let me show you that in case you missed it. Vitality, sovereignty, art, creativity. It all sounds good. Who could, uh, who could want anything else? Cheap revisionism must always be avoided. It's always tempting to simply invert the consensus of the cathedral, as if it was not infallible, but the inverse of infallible, like the Cretan in the parable who always lies. This is an error which, by definition, cannot escape the cathedral's frame. I pause again. I wonder how many of you who have heard Curtis Yarvin talk about the cathedral or write about it, you're familiar with that concept, think that the way around it is to invert it. Here he's telling you, absolutely not. This is an error which, by definition, cannot escape the cathedral's frame, like Carl Schmitt's anti-liberalism, which couldn't escape Hobbes's frame. If it always lied from mere perversity, our job would be easy. Actually, the cathedral almost never lies, and when it lies, it has no idea that it is lying. But a few lies can do a lot of work. Usually, the conclusions that these cheap revisionists prefer are the most striking and dramatic. Therefore, striking and dramatic revisions are especially to be distrusted. The truth usually has a subtle smell. The deep right is the faction of truth. So if you identify with the deep right, if you're concerned with the timeless neutrality and vitality, and here with the truth, then you cannot have these striking and dramatic revisions. Curtis Yarvin is telling you, you have to deal with subtle on one hand, the subtlety of the truth, and on the other hand, the difficulty of intellectual sovereignty. The scale of careful professional work involved in a serious program of intellectual revision is almost beyond belief. Yeah, and let me just pause and comment on that. It needs the support structures to match that scale. Okay, it's not going to be just one or two people who can accomplish the serious program of intellectual revision. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of scaffolding that needs to be built, a lot of institutional support for the establishment of the structures of the new deep right. Anyway, all scholarship from the last two centuries, at least, needs to be reevaluated on the basis of its relationship to power. The comprehensive revision of the intellectual record is a task on the scale of a state. Yeah, again, I point out to you here, not so that you look at the course, but just so that you read the book or at least know the idea. Aristotle argued that the close link between a regime and its education is like this. Okay, in other words, so intimately bound with one another that if you're going to have a new regime, you need to have a new education. And that's something to take place, quote unquote, as Yarvin writes here, on the scale of a state. Fortunately, not only is it a task for a state, it is a task any new state needs because the new regime will need many job opportunities for its unemployed intellectuals. Some of this work can even be done while the old regime remains in power. Yeah, like it's a kind of... Um, what do you call that? Exile, regime in exile, right? Forming its, uh, forming its foundation for when it does take power. Though private actors probably cannot raise enough money to finish the job properly. The most important field to revise is political science. Completely agree. Hence, millermanschool.com. Since political science dictates the purpose and organization of the new regime, all other revisions will be performed by an organization founded on sound political science. Aristotle, look at that. Beautiful. Curtis Yarvin, yes. Hume, Mosca, etc. Absolutism, next principle here. So a reminder for those of you who have joined, we're reading Curtis Yarvin, graymirror.substack.com, gray with an A, principles of the deep right. And we are now after, I personally am very satisfied to see him emphasize the importance of political science. We move on now to this principle of absolutism. 
Does anyone really still believe in quote unquote limited government? Limited by who exactly? What's up with all this passive voice? The deep right knows that all government is absolute. Because of this, the deep right is only interested in paths to absolute power. It treats all other paths as traps since they're by definition dead ends. The more attractive the first steps into a trap, the deadlier the trap in the end and political traps can last decades. Not all paths to power go from zero to one in a single step. Incremental victories are plausible and probably necessary, but to an absolutist, an incremental victory is not an end, but only a means. There can even be incremental sacrifice. Few paths uphill go straight up. The political goal of the deep right is straightforward. Replace the regime. This end creates a set of paths which have nothing that looks even remotely like incremental victory. Rather, the first step toward absolutism is to create a credible backup regime. Any process from a military coup to a normal election that can replace regime A must replace it with some regime B. If regime B has to be built on the spot during the replacement process, that process is much more dangerous and unlikely to work. You see, this is the preparing the institutions in exile, as it were. Any head start on the job makes your revolution much safer. Yeah, I think he's right about that. So in most regime changes, something like the next regime has been built, either as an organ of the old regime, or as a party or network in the private sector, or even as a foreign regime before the revolution even starts. Revolutions are hard and need every head start they can get. Often, no revolution is possible at all. And if there's no practical way for the people to replace the regime, by definition, the people live not in a democracy, but in an autocracy. If the citizens do not have the power to change the government, they are not in power. If they are in power, they can change not just the politicians, but the policies. Not just the policies, but the staff. Not just the staff, but the structures. Not just the structures, but the very form of government itself. Now, Yarvin takes us right up against a difficult question, treated as he well knows in such places as Carl Schmitt's legality and legitimacy, about whether a people can ever institute a constitution that in principle is open to its own replacement. But okay, here he's finding the locus of power and suggesting that you can change the very form of government itself, that you have a basis for the legitimacy of a regime change. If the citizens are in power, they even have the power to give up their power irreversibly, turning themselves from citizens to subjects. But their lack of power could come from two causes. One, some force prevents them from exercising that power. Two, there's no such force, but they have no way to use their power. For example, if the people do have the sovereignty to replace the regime, but do not have a backup regime to replace it with, they don't have the sovereignty in practice only in theory. Creating a credible backup regime, even a partially constructed one, disambiguates the question of popular sovereignty. Do the people support the regime? If they have no option but to support the regime, there's no way to know. One might as well poll them to see if they preferred A to A. Okay, you see what he's saying here? If you want to know whether the people prefer the regime, there has to be a regime alternative that you could run, that you could poll them about, that you could ask them about, that you could see which one they would rather be citizens or subjects of. In as much as there exists any credible B, regime B, even the outline of a B, the poll becomes live, becomes relevant. There's actually something there to have people think about and choose from. Thus, creating a credible backup regime asks the citizens a question which they've never been asked before. Until this question can be asked in a credible way, no one knows what the answer would even be. The mere existence of a B, of an alternative, alternate regime, may create a preference defalsification cascade across society. Nice phrase. Or the problem might be much harder, but it sure can't hurt. Okay, so let's review. This was Curtis Yarvin, graymere.substack.com, gray with an A, Principles of the Deep Right, published today, I think, yeah. And he gave us the name, the Deep Right, and why he thinks it's good right here. It's not aggrandizing, but mildly positive. With a hint of risk, it mirrors deep state. It has a little bit of flavor, but not so much as to be cringe, and it's his, so he gets to make the rules. It has five principles, timelessness, so it's anti-progressivism, neutrality, which I think was somehow the most, possibly the most contestable of the principles here. I wonder what you think about that. 
vitalism, maybe this was a contestable principle. What does it mean to be in a state of vitality? What's the relationship between vitality and excellence or vitality and the virtues? If you think classically is vitality a Nietzschean type notion, we don't really know from this post, but I think that it was fair to agree that uh, when we look at America today, do we feel that most people we see are living up to their full human potential? Probably not. Then realism and the, the relationship to truth. So deal with reality and have a fundamental concern with the truth. I liked that. I think he's right about that. Uh, I pointed out here about the difference between unipolar cathedral and multipolar bazaar. One of the reasons I support parts of Dugan's presentation of a multipolar world has to do with that kind of argument. Thinking, the new regime must think from scratch. In other words, it must establish its own paidauma. It must have its own model of education. It must develop some intellectual sovereignty. And obviously, I couldn't help but resonate with this argument here that the most important of all the fields to revise is political science. In part, that's what I'm trying to do at millermanschool.com. Since political science dictates the purpose and organization of the new regime. Okay. And you see here, giving a shout out to Aristotle. That's nice. You have to wonder, what about Plato? What about the other figures in the history of political philosophy? And what about their disputes and disagreements? But okay, if Curtis Yarvin is arguing that we should do a return to the principles of Plato's politics, I'm all for it. So vitalism, and then we saw absolutism. Whoops, sorry about that. Absolutism means you're going to try to take power absolutely, not incrementally. But the way to do that is to develop a parallel set of institutions, your regime in exile, the regime B, so that the people have an option, so that in principle they have somewhere to defect to. Well, I enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed it as well. I offered some commentary along the way. We didn't just do a flat out reading, gave you some connections and other things to think about. You should subscribe to Curtis Yarvin's Substack, definitely. And this was not behind a paywall, so I don't think we broke any rules in reading it together. Let me just pop over to the chat, see how everybody's doing. Whoops. One of these days I'll have this set up a little bit more smoothly than I do now. Thanks for bearing with me. Oh, that's reasonable, isn't it? Let's just shut it down. There we go. Okay, really nice to be with everybody here. When did it become the deep right? That's just Yarvin proposing that name. That's all. Uh, he's just proposing the name, the deep right, and his five principles that we went over. Dash Cam Sam, my favorite Mencius Mold book quote, in many ways, Nonsense is a more effective organizing tool than the truth. Anyone can believe in the truth. To believe in nonsense is an unforgivable demonstration of loyalty. It serves as a political uniform. And if you have a uniform, you have an army. Definitely, definitely thought provoking. Colleges teach uh, crap these days, writes Tenzin. Yeah, it's a problem. You can read Alan Bloom's Closing of the American Mind, for example, about how higher education is destroying the souls of young people. Obviously, my endeavor at millermanschool.com is to help on the political science front by putting some quality material back on the table, but it's a bigger problem than any one alternative can solve. As Yarvin argued also in his piece, right, it requires state-level uh, intervention. I agree that the opposite of a concept is not always the inversion of the concept, but oppositions. Yes, yeah, so you remember Yarvin had said, don't oppose the cathedral just by inverting it. You have to do more than that. Scott writes, uh, it looks like you're responding to someone, Scott, so I don't want to have missed out on the thread, but get kids away from TV and out of public schools. The regime is a far more malicious kleptocrat, massive jobs program that corrupts food, medicine, housing, transit, and currency. Tenzin asks anyone here, listen to Jason Giorgiani. He's wildly fantastic. I'll say, look, I know that he's said, from what I understand, some outlandish things and I don't know him personally. I've only read one of his works, Prometheism. I think it's called Prometheism or Prometheism. But that was a thought-provoking read on the question of science and technology. I do think that particular book is worth a look. I can't really say anything else about his other books because I haven't read them. A dash cam, Sam. Vitalism is also the name of an awesome guitar band from Brazil. Okay, nice. I bet you Curtis Yarvin would, uh, would like that. Vital or just manifesting life. Yeah, you see the problem here of considering vitalism a key principle is it leaves unspecified the difference between life and the good life, life as an expression of life force versus some more classical notion of 
human nature, the human soul, the hierarchies of the human soul, the relationship between contemplative thinking and practical thinking, prudence and theory and so on. You know, it's a big question. So I like the assertion of vitality, but I just don't know that it goes, I mean, okay, this is a single Substack post. It's not like he gave us a whole book or essay on the meaning of vitalism for political communities and societies. But, you know, he referred to Aristotle, let's say, and vitalism as such is not a key principle in Aristotle's political science. Now, what in the world is this thing up on the screen? All right, whatever, it's gone. Can you even read this? Yeah. Can I make that? Is that going to be better for you? Dun, dun, dun. That's better. Whatever. You all see it, right? Okay. What else do we have here? Vitality sounds like Nietzsche. Yeah, you know, Joshua, when I hear people assert vitalism, as I say, in a context where we're lacking vitality socially, that's valuable. On the other hand, if we're putting Nietzsche on the table, we need to be well aware, I think, of the alternatives to Nietzsche that are also worthy of our consideration. Like Aristotle, for example, Yarvin mentioned Aristotle. Aristotle is not Nietzschean, you know? So if we have a Nietzschean interpretation of vitality, it's not gonna be the same as Plato, as Aristotle, it may not be the same as Machiavelli, as other thinkers. So what, when I hear about intellectual sovereignty and the need for a regime, and for thoughtfulness and all of the kinds of things that Yarvin wrote about, I, though I'm obviously predisposed towards this already, here, okay, we need to do a serious study in the history of political philosophy to make sure we understand the alternatives and can choose uh, among them thoughtfully. Yarvin is correct in his strategy about being purposeful and not wasting energy in fighting the regime, but it's hard to follow with the vax and sexual liberalist policies with children. Yeah, so some of you may think that this principle of the neutrality of the deep, right, as not having a dog in the fight, not getting involved, not being either for or against the existing alternatives within the regime, but rather working to formulate the principles of an alternative regime, uh, cedes too much ground or too much territory to those who are engaged in politics that you oppose. You know, so on one hand, even while you're articulating the principles of a regime alternative, Maybe even while that's happening, you still have a dog in the fight in terms of the on-the-ground political controversies. I wonder what Yarvin has said about that or would say about it. If you know, you can post in the chat. Uh, impossible for reason to be value neutral. How else to decide what's worth studying? Yeah, well, you see about that neutrality point, Curtis Yarvin was not arguing, so far as I could understand, that you have to be value neutral through and through. Rather, he seems to be saying, you should be neutral with respect to the dogfights in the existing regime, but not neutral with respect to the worth of the regime as such. It's because he's critical of the regime as such that he's arguing for the elaboration of an alternative. But in order to do that with due diligence and thoughtfulness and focus, it sounds like he's saying, don't get caught up in the intra-regime fights of regime A. Just deny it and start building the institutions of regime B. Okay, so that value neutrality doesn't run. It's neutral within the, va the fight of... Um... By the way, he also doesn't say B value neutral. Let's go. Should we go back to that for a minute? Hold on a second. Let's make sure we try to get this point right. Okay, where's neutrality? Uh-huh. So, you see, he doesn't say that the deep right is neutral because there's no right answer. He doesn't say the deep right is neutral because it's as supportive of one position as it is of the other. He says that it's neutral because it knows there's no advantage in taking any side in a struggle. The realist analysis tells us that what's open for us to do is take power. And getting involved in the dogfight within regime A is not conducive to the development of the kind of power that would overcome the issue fundamentally. So I think that's what he's saying here. I don't see him writing that the neutrality is a value neutrality. You see, it's only necessary to win. Okay, it's a realist power politics neutrality. Hopefully that's clear. Uh, that's how I read it. I could be wrong. 
Curtis Yarvin, if you're watching this, am I wrong? Or is that accurate? Jim Bowden, hi, Michael from Sydney, Australia. Hello, Jim, nice to see you. Australia, love your work. Thank you, take on Alexander Dugan, appreciate it. Uh, Tom Sunik, yeah, I, I think he published some books with Arctos, did he not? He's familiar, knows Alexander Dugan like yourself. Okay, nice to see you, Jim. Patrick Bateman, greetings and salutations to you as well. So thank you everybody for being here. I hope that you found that to be a valuable read. Again, subscribe to Curtis Yarvin's graymirror.substack.com. Substack, gray, as he always likes to remind you with an A. We were reading and discussing his recent post, Principles of the Deep Right. I would love it if you could leave some comments, like, subscribe, share, and do all of those things. As usual, I direct you to millermanschool.com in case there are any courses there that interest you. Um, last few comments here. I read some Nietzsche. He's okay, but mostly boring, reactionary, materialist crap. But I do like his idea of the eternal recurrence and his identification of the death of spirituality and modernity. Okay, Nietzsche, obviously well worth a read. And you can study him. He had a big effect on Leo Strauss, who says that he believed pretty much everything he read in Nietzsche until the age of 30. And you can find Leo Strauss's lecture courses on books like Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And just while I'm on this topic, Strauss wrote some uh, something about Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil. And there's a good book about what Strauss had to say on Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil by a guy named Lawrence Lampert. And the book is called, I think, Leo Strauss and Nietzsche. So definitely read, study Nietzsche. I'm thinking that the next course I do at millermanschool.com might be on Nietzsche. Haven't decided yet. Do you think timelessness has some ideas from Oswald Spangler's cyclical theory of history? You know, it's a good question, Ali, because Yarvin does mention in that section on timelessness. Let's just put it up on screen for the record. Where, how do I do that? Oops. Here we go. Let's go over to timelessness. If I'm not mistaken, he did say something about cycles here. What did he say? <laughs> maybe the current period is different, or maybe it's just part yet of yet another cycle. Okay, or as you put it here, um, the historical pattern of regime evolution is never monotonic and always cyclic. So he identifies the cycle of regimes, but he leaves open the possibility that the current period is different or that it's part of a cycle. So he's not committed to a cyclical view in this presentation. I certainly would not say that he's committed to a Spanglerian cyclical theory of history, but he seems to, let's put it this way, leave open different interpretations of the meaning of time for politics so long as they reject progressivism and the imposition of the, uh, how does he write it here? I'm just blocking my screen. The attribution of the progress of physical science into the political. So that puts Curtis Yarvin in the company of all of the people we usually talk about on this channel, I think, who share that rejection of Whig history, rejection of progressivism, some assertion of timelessness, whether it's Straussian form or... But again, there are varieties here. You know, not every view that politics has its own temporality is progressivistic. So there are views of history that see it as a downfall or a decay, which is neither timeless nor progressivistic, you see. But at any rate, timelessness was one of the five principles of the deep right as Yarvin uh, presented them. What else do we have here in the comments? Oh, this is fun, guys. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you to Curtis Yarvin for giving us something to discuss. William writes, surprised to hear of Aristotle from Yarvin. From what I gathered from his work, he has more of a Machiavellian flavor. It made me think of one of your presentations on Strauss. Yeah. I can't encourage strongly enough, those of you who are here, listening, watching, who have an interest in Curtis Yarvin, politics, political science, political theory, read Machiavelli, read Aristotle, and my personal recommendation, make use of and take advantage of the fact that there once was a guy like Leo Strauss who gave us such insight into the works of Machiavelli and Aristotle that I think we owe him our gratitude as students of political science for a very long time. Mohammed, we need the Millerman Yarvin collab. Could happen. I don't know him. I've never met him, never spoken with him, no correspondence, nothing. But as you can see, I consider him to be thoughtful and I'm glad to share some of his works with you in this format. Okay, a couple of comments about uh, Georgiani here. Like I said, all I really know about him is the Prometheism book. And uh, he's also mentioned in, what's the guy's name? Benjamin Teitelbaum's book, War for Eternity 
which is about Steve Bannon and what's it called? The subtitle, like the network of far right power brokers or something like that. But in that book, War for Eternity, there are some sections there that talk about Arctos, the publisher. And at some point, Giorgiani was an editor there. And if you have any interest in his personal background, I suppose you could have a look at what they say about him in that book. Kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Not drama, but uh, some intrigue around his time as an editor at Arctos. But honestly, I don't concern myself with those things. All I can tell you is that the Prometheism book of his is worth a read. And it gives you something to think about in terms of the relationship of technology to society. All right, I was going to go, but let's just, just stick around for a little bit longer just to address the comments here. Lambert has commentaries on two of Nietzsche's books. Okay, good. I recommend, I'll just put the name in here for those of you who, I think it's spelled like this, Lawrence Lampert. Some scholarship on Leo Strauss, on uh, Nietzsche. His book on Strauss and Nietzsche is well worth a read. He brings up a crucially, crucially important point by the end of it. Uh, one by day, right? So is the article saying that it's better to put your efforts into creating an alternative versus fighting the current regimes? Yeah, I think it is actually. That's the impression that I got of his article. You need to articulate the institutions of an alternative regime instead of get, getting involved in the squabbles of regime A or the existing regime. Spinley, I just caught the last five minutes. We'll have to start over. Okay. Hopefully you enjoy it. We just went over Yarvin, Yarvin's article with some commentary. Uh -huh. All right. Well, great being with you all. I really appreciate it. If you like what I'm doing on this channel, like, share, subscribe, etc. I hate to have to ask, but it'd be great if you would. And millermanschool.com, besides the courses, which do cost money, there's a free trial that you might like. At any rate, great to be with you. Good to see you. Thanks for your time and attention. Thank you to Curtis Yarvin, and I will see you in the next video.